Um, so good afternoon and thank you for coming. My name is Dana Olenoff. Um, I work at Widener University outside of Philadelphia. And this is Amy Hillen. She works at Kennesaw State University uh, near Atlanta. And we're part of a larger group. We call ourselves the Taskmasters. And we met at a math education conference, um, the Psychology of Mathematics Education Conference. And they have a lot of working groups. And our working group was interested in helping prepare prospective elementary teachers and helping people who teach content courses for prospective elementary teachers. And our subgroup um, was interested in designing tasks for math courses for elementary teachers. Um, because we know that it's very, very important to have good tasks if you're trying to get people to learn elementary content. Um, so the other four members of our group, Ava Thanheiser, Rachel Welder, Ziv Feldman, and Jennifer Tobias, were unable to attend today, but they definitely helped in the preparation of all of this work. So we're going to be talking about today um, modifying children's mathematical tasks to use in content courses for prospective teachers. And so the first question is, why would we want to do this? And so one answer is that one thing that's important in task design is something called task authenticity. And so if we're teaching people who are going to be teachers, if we use things that they really need to know, if we use an elementary task, that's something they need to know how to do because that's what they're going to be teaching. So it makes it more authentic. And this can help develop what we call MKT, which stands for Mathematical Knowledge for Teaching. And that is basically the knowledge required by the work of teaching. And um, another reason to use children's tasks is that if we can frame our work around things that children encounter in the classroom, but make it harder, make it more challenging, then it provides an experience very similar to how children would learn. And so the teachers can see this is how children might use, learn this topic. Um, but we want to do it at a more advanced level, because if we just give them elementary tasks, it might not be a problem for them. It may not be challenging. So um, if you, I think everybody's getting a handout or um, should have a handout. And if you take a look at page two of the handout packet, um, we have a task that is from um, Investigations, which is a reform-oriented curriculum. Um, and this is a fifth grade task on fraction comparison. And so we want you to take a look at this task and think about uh, three questions. What mathematical ideas does this task have the potential to elicit for children and also for prospective teachers? Um, what would you need to consider or plan for if you wanted to use this task for prospective elementary teachers? And in what ways would you modify the task for prospective elementary teachers and why? So you may not think you would modify it at all, or you may think, yeah, we want to modify this. Um, so we're going to give you some time to talk amongst yourselves and think about the answers to these questions. And we'll come around and listen to what you have to say. And then we'll tell you, kind of summarize what you said and talk about some of our own ideas. Well, but then I And so one of the things that we found was that modifying the tasks themselves to away from finding the right answer to asking them specifically for the um, unless they were working with like a lot messier numbers. Um, so yeah, that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So we hate to interrupt all these really um, thoughtful conversations. We were wondering if maybe a representative from each table could go to the, one of the microphones and just share out a little bit of the ideas that they talked about with respect to the task or ways to modify it um, or other ideas that, that they had shared. Uh, Milo Savic, University of Oklahoma. And uh, when I looked at the handout, I had uh, hearkened back to when I used to do professional development for sixth and seventh grade uh, teachers. And we played a game where we called it birthday fraction number line. Uh, basically, you would put the numerator of the fraction as your birth month, numerical birth month, and the denominator as your birth day. So mine would be two fourteenths, and therefore uh, you would you would get all the teachers or all the students in uh, order from least to greatest using this, and so it was a nice, um, let me put it, non-confrontational -con way to introduce maybe not not regular benchmark fractions. Um, it also helped spark a lot of discussion with techniques of how they got themselves ordered. And uh, it could also lead to some mathematical inquiry, such as what's the largest birthday fraction you could ever have, and what's the smallest, and then how many unique birthday fractions are there. So I don't know. These are kind of crazy ideas, but it also it was it was a lot of uh, advantages to that. Two advantages would be that it's personal to the student or the teacher. The teacher or student owns that fraction. That's them. And the second thing is it got them physically up and active, all of them. So, so Mylan, is there any? Can someone from your group share? Mylan Sherman, Drake University. Um, a big theme in our group was this idea of the part-whole relationship that these, in terms of the mathematical idea, that these fractions would have to be parts of the same whole in order to be comparable. And one of the things we talked about was that maybe um, asking pre-service elementary teachers to think about other ways to represent in their comparisons besides using uh, common denominators in order to try to make those ideas more explicit. So how about the table? Um Stephen and Julian, do you have anything that you want to share out from what your group talked about? It's okay if the answer is no. Okay. Um, so some of the other things I heard that were not shared, and that's okay. Um, I heard somebody say, "Well, I would I would give this task to prospective teachers because I think it would be challenging for them," um, and we agree. Um, it we do, and it is. Um, and, but they also said, but then I would add more. Um, I would add more to it. Um, I heard some other people say, you know, um, you could use common denominators. You could use the same strategy on any, all of these problems. Um, but with prospective teachers, you would want them to know more than just one strategy, more than, than the common denominator strategy or the, I think you said the butterfly strategy or cross multiplication, I guess we have called it. Um, and as teachers especially, we want them to know more than just, oh, I could do this problem. We want them to know many ways to do this problem. And I think that um, another thing that I heard was looking for perhaps the most, a more efficient strategy than just common denominators that potentially some of these problems lend themselves to other strategies that would be more efficient in order to solve them. So um, that's some of the stuff I heard. Is there anything? Well, um, when Milos, is that right? Um, when he was talking about the birthday fractions, um, the first thing that popped in my mind is by having each teacher identify their birthday fraction, right then and there you're guaranteed to have a very wide variety of fractions that are um, more than one, less than one. Um, you had also mentioned that you might end up having teachers that had equivalent birthday fractions, um, and so you've got a, a host of fractions that are a lot messier than the ones in this children's task, and that might um, up the level of challenge for prospective teachers. Um, so we're going to 
continue now with some of our ideas. So one, one thing that we want to do in thinking about preparing future teachers is to look at the Common Core. Um, I'm guessing that most people have at least heard the words Common Core. Um, these are a set of standards, uh, both practice standards and um, content standards for um, that it should be common across the United States um, that students should learn. And so if we have people that are going to be teachers, they should be familiar with the mathematics in the Common Core. So the first thing we did was look at the Common Core. And all of these fraction comparisons uh, align with strategies that are in the Common Core. Um, so the first one is Probably, and it's not to say that they couldn't be solved in another way, but this is probably the most efficient way to solve these. Um, so the first one is the common denominator method. You could make three fifths into six tenths and then compare seven tenths is more than six tenths because seven of something is more than six of the same thing. Um, and that is one of two of the common core standards, one that shows up in third grade and one in fourth grade. Um, number two is actually the hardest. Um, so I guess number four would probably be the second hardest, um, or the second easiest, which uses what we would call the same number of pieces or the common numerator strategy. And so if we, we could say that one third is the same as three ninths, and then if we compare an eighth to a ninth, if we think that if we break a hole up into eight pieces and we break that same hole up into nine pieces, the eighth pieces will be bigger. And so three eighths will be more than three ninths. Um, and then another strategy, number three, is comparing to a benchmark. And I heard some people say this, um, that if I look at four-thirds, it's more than one. If I look at three-fourths, it's less than one. So four-thirds must be more than three-fourths. Um, and then the second one uses a combination of strategies. We look at the benchmark of one, and we say both of these are missing one piece from one but 7 eighths is missing an eighth piece, and 9 tenths is missing a tenth piece, and we had determined that eighths are bigger than tenths. So the eighth, 7 eighths is further away from one. It's more less than one, if that makes sense. Um, and therefore, it's smaller. And so we said, all right, these are all strategies that come show up in the Common Core so that our prospective teachers should know them. And so we want to design a task that will help make prospective teachers come up with these strategies, that, that hopefully they'll come up with them on their own. We don't want to just tell them, like, here's some strategies, now compare some fractions. We want to design a task that they're using IBL where they have to um, come up with the strategies on their own. And so in this process, we came up with this task design cycle. And this is how our group has operated in designing this task. We started by selecting a children's task, and then we modified it. We implemented the task in our classrooms and collected data. We analyzed the data and then reflected on it to say, did we meet our goals, um, which were mostly to get our students to come up with these strategies. And then we actually redesign the task. So if you turn to the next page in your packet, you'll see the tasks that we came up with. And a lot of the ideas that you either hinted at or suggested are in this task. Um, and so we had some goals in designing this task. Um, we wanted to, the main goal was to strengthen what we call their fraction number sense. Um, because we don't really care if they can say that uh, 7 tenths is less than 8 ninths. Like, we're happy that they know that. But we really want them to be able to explain why in a sense-making way. Um, we don't want them to just perform procedures. We want them to understand what they're doing. Um, and. So the two kind of main ideas we were looking at was we wanted to ensure a high level of cognitive demand, which I think goes along with IBL. Um, cognitive demand comes out of uh, the group at Pittsburgh. I don't know what the name of the group is. 
it's originally the Quasar Project. Yeah, it yeah. originally was called the Quasar Project, but um, there's much literature on it if you'd like to read it. Um, and also to provide opportunities for prospective teachers to develop their mathematical knowledge for teaching. So some things that we wanted to think about, and this is what we've said, we want to encourage teachers to seek alternative strategies by making their familiar procedures more difficult to apply. So if you notice um, the directions under the notes, it says calculators may not be used. So if you look at a lot of the denominators and numerators of these fractions, without a calculator trying to use common denominators is probably not the most efficient strategy. And that doesn't mean that they won't try it, but we try and discourage it. Um, we want to encourage solving problems in multiple ways. So we put a number of problems on here that would most efficiently be solved using different strategies, not just one strategy. Um, we wanted to include problems that would elicit misconceptions that we know children have um, and that we were pretty sure that also prospective teachers would have. Um, and a lot of that is applying whole number reasoning to fractions. So for example, with the 7 eighths and 9 tenths problem, a lot of children and some prospective teachers will say those are equal because they're both missing one piece. And they don't take into consideration the size of the pieces. So we wanted to make sure that we included problems that would either bring out those strategies with our, our students, our, those prospective teachers, or if they didn't, we could say, hey, students sometimes think these are equal. Why do you think that is? Um, and then we also wanted to provide opportunities for problem posing as well as problem solving, because part of the job of teaching is posing problems, designing problems for your students. And so we wanted to include that as well. And we are not talking a lot about the problem posing activity, but um, at the end of the talk, we'll tell you about our website. And you can see this task actually has five different components, um, and we've only shared one with you. So um, in the interest of time. So. Um, an example of how we modify this task, the children's task, to include some examples on our own task. Um, so the problem from the children's task was 7 eighths versus 9 tenths. And we have four problems that are of this type um, in our task. And so we chose 8 ninths and 12 thirteenths. That would discourage the use of manipulatives or fraction strips because we don't have thirteenths usually um, with fraction strips or pattern blocks or most things. Um, and we chose uh, 13 fifteenths and 17 nineteenths because it was missing two pieces. So we thought this is a little different, but we'd like you, hopefully, to make the connection between the two problems. They come right after each other on the worksheet. Um, we picked 25 twelfths and 31 fifteenths because in this case, um, both of these fractions are more than the benchmark rather than less than. So it's a similar strategy, but it's a little different. And also, in this case, the benchmark is two rather than one. Um, and also, 11 20ths versus 19 36 Again, both are more one piece more than the benchmark, and this time the benchmark is one half. So to get them looking at different benchmarks rather than just one. Um, and then another thing that we wanted to do was we came up with a strategy that was not on the children's task. And this strategy, I'll take that away for an, a minute, we call um, the greater number of larger pieces strategy. And so on our original version of the task, we actually had one problem that was supposed to elicit this GLP strategy that we talk about. Um, and the problem was 7 tenths versus 8 ninths. And the idea behind the strategy is that 8 ninths has more pieces than 7 tenths, and it also has larger pieces. So if it has more larger pieces, it must be bigger. Well, the problem was this problem did not really elicit the strategy because I think they intuitively thought that 8 ninths was bigger than 7 tenths. They kind of had decimal ideas in their heads. 
only, I think, two students out of like 50 something used the strategy we wanted. So then we um, redesign the task and we have three problems that are meant to elicit the strategy. Um, and the first one is very difficult to solve using another strategy. It's not impossible. There are many other ways you could do it. But without a calculator, we hoped that, hey, 1825th has more pieces and they're bigger. And that did come out. And we also included uh, this problem, 2 sevenths versus 3 eighths, which cannot be solved using greater number of larger pieces. So we wanted to be able to compare problems that could use this strategy versus problems that couldn't. These are some things that we'd like you to potentially consider, um, but also we have about four minutes left, so if people have questions, um, if you don't want to consider our things, we'll just move to the last slide. Um, we're happy to answer questions. We have a website, it's on our handout. Um, on the website, there is uh, copies of all five uh, parts of the task and a facilitation guide. Um, we also have our presentations, like the slides and the handout for this presentation will be there and other uh, lists of resources for potentially looking for children's tasks. So we're happy to answer any questions if you have them. Hello, Stephen Greenstein, Montclair State University. Uh, your goal was to have them invent strategies to develop their fraction sense. Lots of different fractions have multiple meanings, as you know. I'm wondering if these comparison problems only restrict them to, only draw on particular uh, meanings of fractions, like part whole. So can you talk about what's the benefit of inventing strategies for maybe in general? I mean, I know we want to engage them in those situations, but. I guess just in terms of their fractional knowledge, what kind of, how did you see that develop? Um, so I think that's a great question. Um, one criticism of fraction teaching in general is that there is a, a lot of emphasis on the part whole strategy. Um, I think we like to think about fractions. We start this activity by asking um, our students to list everything they know about seven eighths. And the first thing they'll say is seven out of eight. Um, but we try and move beyond that to think of seven eighths as, as seven iterations of a one eighth piece or seven one eighth pieces. Um, and so that moves a little bit away from the part whole. We look at number lines um, as fractions as actual numbers on number lines. Um, we've had some, we actually have a strategy that we're kind of debating as to how it works as a strategy, but we call it the benchmark um, equivalent strategy where um, the first question on our task is one half versus 17 31sts. And so one way to think about it is kind of a, as an operator as 17 is more than half of 31. Like I'm operating, using the one half as an operator on 17 um, to determine that that's more than half of 31. So that's one way of determining the solution. Um, I do think that a lot of it does focus on part whole and we see a lot of pies and rectangles and, and shaded in. Um, so, it's something to think about. And um, I, I do think that this task buys us a lot in terms of um, down the line. So in my class, we spend a lot of time on this task, but it buys me a lot when we start to think about operating with fractions, um, because I think they have a deeper number sense. And so then when we start to think about um, combining one half and one third, um, they have a sense of what that combination should be close to and have a sense that, you know, two fifths um, is an answer that children might give and it's not a reasonable answer in that case. Um, so thank you for coming and it's time for the next speaker to um, get set up. But we're happy to answer questions afterwards as well. So.